In Mexico, the bloody tentacles of organised crime reach into even the smallest communities. But one town fought back. The people of Chadan were determined to save their precious forest from the men who came to steal it. I'm Linda Presley, and this is Assignment on the BBC World Service. So where we're driving through now on this rough track through a small herd of cows, this is where the organised crime and the illegal loggers would have parked their trucks, ready to take their booty of wood uh, out of Chadan. And in those days, this was a no-go area for the people. This place was very, very dangerous, muy peligroso. Luis Sanchez is my guide along the trails and through the clearings of these ancient pine forests. We think of Mexico's cartels as primarily making money from drugs, but they've long since diversified and seek to dominate any lucrative industry, including timber. Sometimes the bad people kill someone. Like, aquí murió, ¿te acuerdas, Gallo? This place, they kill one guy, you know. One farmer? Yeah. So the local farmers, they couldn't come yeah. and look after their animals yeah. and they couldn't come and look after their land in those uh -huh. times? Yeah. A lot of people die in this place. But now, now, Luis, it's very hard to believe these stories because it's so peaceful. Yeah. Ahora ya no, es, ya no, ya no vivimos con ese, con ese miedo, pues. So now, now Luis is saying that they don't yeah, live now. with this fear. Uh -huh. Now it's, it's very quiet. We feel good. Now it's very different. Not just different, absolutely unique. An oasis of hope in Michoacán, the Mexican state where severed human heads have been rolled onto dance floors and grenades lobbed into crowded plazas. Five years ago, in 2011, the people of Chadan had enough. This Pura Pecha indigenous community of some 20,000 rose up. They threw out the paramilitary loggers working with organised crime, chased away the mayor and the municipal police under the influence of those cartels and banned all political parties. Crucially, Charan recruited its own armed militia or police force from people in the town, the Ronda Comunitaria, to protect the town and defend the forest. Ruben Huarocco, wearing fatigues, his assault rifle slung across his shoulders, takes us out on patrol. Right here there were good trees, one of those old trees, you know, big ones, real big. They just cut them and then put them on the truck. So we're deep now inside the lungs of Charan, the pine forest that tumbles down the hills into the town. And we're walking around the side of one of the hills and we can see really clearly the spaces here where the illegal loggers with the help of organized crime took so much of the timber so this looks pretty bad here Ruben yeah this is uh it's one of the most uh, devastating so their trucks used to come up yes, this track all the way to the top they say that when they they took it uh full they probably we're talking about maybe 15,000 pesos over a thousand dollars so here, there's just stumps of trees. We're just walking over stumps. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and those criminal groups, mm -hmm. the cartels, people talk about La Familia, yeah. the Knights Templar. Mm -hmm. Are they still strong around Charan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're real strong. But right here in Charan, since we start, you know, doing the Ronda Comunitaria. Since uh, the community police started. Yes. No more uh, extortion, no more uh, coming and taking people, you know. Kidnap. None of that. And can you sustain it? Can it continue? Yeah, but I worry. Maybe I'm not going to be here all the time. And I want to, if I'm not here, I want to leave another person to do the same thing that I'm doing. You're talking about when you're not here, you mean if you're killed? Yeah, if something happens, you know. Because I know maybe, like I said, our neighbors, probably when they finish everything, they're going to... Uh, if, they, if they finish cutting, if the criminals have finished cutting all their forests, they're mm -hmm. going to come again for Charan. Yeah, I think they're just waiting for a chance, you know, for us to give up or I don't know, and maybe they'll come back. Are I, you scared? A mm, little bit, but, uh, but like I always say, you know, like uh, Americans say, you know, somebody's got to do the job. <laughs> Ruben has first-hand experience of Americans. There's a long tradition of migrants from Sharan heading north for seasonal agricultural work or to settle. It's why we find so many English speakers in this small traditional community. After we collect the seed, 
we have to clean it up. Well, we're, we're on a large concreted area, and in front of us this is a huge area of pine cones that have been collected. This is the tree nursery of Charan. Very, very important here, because it's here that they're growing the new pine trees uh, that will be replanted in the devastated forest. And Domingo Madrigal and Roberto Sixtus, two of the managers, are going to show us round. What I understand is that the Charan has 17,000 hectares of forest and 9,000 of those hectares were taken by the organised crime working with the illegal loggers, yeah? That's, right. That's almost half. Yeah, but uh, you can see we're trying to do the job again. I should say that this is a, it's a huge nursery. We have the capacity for 1 million and 500 little pine trees. 1 million and a half pine trees. Uh -huh. Wow. Of the, the forest that was devastated, how much has been reforested? 3,000 hectares already. In five years? Yes. So, Domingo, how does it feel for you? Here you are, somebody who has been a bit of a bad boy in the United States, deported back to Charan. How does it feel for you? being involved in this project? Mm, it's a kind of oh. in sadness. Domingo's getting quite upset. What, what, what's making you sad? What's making you cry? Everything is like the trees. It's part of life. I feel like like the tree, the tree is like a young'un. We see it growing. Like a child? I have a child now, she's two years old. And last week, I took some trees from, from here. I planted them at the house, and I told my little girl, I was like, help me. She helped me plant them. She's like, Daddy, they're going to grow tall and nice. I said, yeah, just like you. And do you worry about organized crime? Do you worry about the criminals, the men with the guns coming back? We're ready for them. We're not scared no more. As we stroll around the nursery, among the women workers in knee-length skirts with shawls wound tightly round their shoulders, we spot someone we know. Hi. This is Doña Mari. We met Doña Mari yesterday. She's a nice lady. She's a hard worker too. She has a very sad story. Oh, yes. But sometimes you lose something to have something. Maria Juarez's loss is written all over her face when we meet her at home. We sit in a living room dominated by a new pine bedstead and a sideboard, both wrapped in cellophane and hewn from timber from the family plot. Furniture carved by Maria's son, the carpenter of the household, now that his father has gone. Antes del levantamiento de aquí de la comunidad de Cherán, Before the uprising in Cherán, my husband worked for the authorities managing the forest and trying to stop the illegal logging. He asked the state government and then the federal government for help with security. He never got any reply. As a family, we tried to persuade him to stop going up there because of the threats. All of this trouble began in 2008. Then in 2011, on February 10th, he went to take some photos of a tree replanting project in the forest. I don't know if they were waiting for him or not, but this was when they chased him and beat him unconscious. He was killed. That's what we heard from an informant. The murderers never returned the body of her husband to Maria. There was a memorial service, but no funeral and no proper investigation. And after he disappeared, the loggers continued to harass Maria, telling her they were going to take the family's trees. The people of Charan lived like this, cowed by the criminals. They felt powerless to resist when masked men roamed around town demanding extortion payments from shopkeepers, and they watched tight-lipped as the loggers' trucks trundled by, piled high with newly cut pine. There were killings and kidnaps. Then one day, April the 15th, 2011, everything changed. That day I was at school when the bells from church were, like, ringing. Melissa Fabian's 18. Her family had only recently arrived back from the U.S. to live in Chiran when the uprising began. 
In school, they just told us that we were like having a problem. I came back home with my friends, but like everyone in the streets were just running around and ladies were running around. Yeah, they just like covered their faces and they were just running around with guns or things like machetes. Was that scary? Yeah, it was scary. You could just like hear shooting, people screaming and the bells of the church just ringing at all time. Those ladies, Melissa remembers, were the catalyst for the uprising. A group of women who met, organised and planned to stop the loggers' pickups on the road into Chalan. The guy who was shot in the head was just around the corner and he tried to see what's happening and they shoot him in the face. As she shows us the place where the town's only casualty during the uprising sustained his injury, Margarita Elvira Romero, in a candy pink hoodie with heavy gold earrings, doesn't look much like a conspirator. So what galvanised the women to take action? The loggers were getting closer and closer to one of the town's water springs. We were worried. Our husbands have cattle. Where would they drink if their spring was gone? If you cut the trees down, there's less water. The priest at our church supported us. He said, what's the matter with people? Are they sleepwalking? They are not saying anything about this. So we women decided to do something instead of our husbands, so they wouldn't be in danger. Early that Friday morning, they blockaded the trucks and took loggers hostage. As the church bells rang out and fireworks exploded in the dawn sky, alerting the community of danger, the people of Charan came running to aid the women. Hotheads were persuaded not to lynch the hostages from an ancient tree outside the church. The police arrived with the mayor. Unknown armed men came to free their hostage friends. When the standoff ended after two loggers were injured by a young man who shot a firework directly at them, Charan began its transformation to the autonomous community it remains. But that April day has stayed with Margarita. Algo triste. It was sad. It made me want to cry remembering it. It was like a horror film. But it was the best thing we could have done. We didn't know what would happen, who we'd be confronting. We asked the police for help, for them to lend us their weapons. Nobody has a gun around here. But the police disappeared and never returned. And it wasn't long before those municipal police officers were driven right out of town, together with the mayor. Political parties were banned because they'd divided and never united the community, and each district of Charan elected representatives to a ruling town council. In many ways, the town returned to its indigenous roots, to the ancient Pura Pecha way of doing things, independent of outsiders. Maria Juarez, the woman whose husband was disappeared in the forest, is grateful the uprising came before the loggers got to the family's trees. They're still there. Thanks to the movement, the trees were saved. That's why when we visit the forest, I feel my husband's waiting for us with open arms. He loved it there so much. He used to say he would give his life for our mountain. The HQ of the Ronda Comunitaria, its signs now painted in Pura Pecha, not Spanish, is the busiest place in Charan early on a Sunday. Serious crime is referred to the Attorney General, but the town dispenses its own justice for minor offences, many of them alcohol-related. This morning, Irma Linda Ramos is in charge at the front desk. Somebody's just come looking for their 15-year-old and Melinda's just told her that, uh, yes, he's here and they picked him up because he failed a breathalyzer test and the woman's got to wait to see if they're going to keep him or if he's going to be fined. So how many did you pick up last night? They are 18, sometimes could be 20, 25. So what's the penalty for being drunk in the street here in Charan? If you are drinking in the street after 10 o'clock, the penalty for that is community work. It's cleaning the streets, 
cleaning the checkpoints and the main square. And what's the penalty if you're drunk driving? If you are drinking and driving, the penalty is $20, $25 plus community work. So, Amalinda, why did you join the Ronda? Why did you want to become a community police officer? I really like to have the experience and I really want to know about weapons and pistols. Before they were forced to hightail it out of town, this building was home to the municipal police. Melinda shows us the main holding cell for prisoners. It's a large area. It's kind of open to the elements. It's got a, um, a grate over the top, obviously, so people can't climb over the walls. And have they been well behaved? Some of them. <laughs> Out here, we've got lots of families waiting. Some not very pleased looking uh, parents, I'd say. Emma Linda's brought us into a room and there's a, a, quite a small cell here and there are three very young guys in here. Hola, buenos dias. One of them is 16 and looks dazed. Another is a few years older and he's cross. So what happened? We find you in this cell this morning. Uh, I was drinking, uh, but look, check it out right here. It's nasty, it's ugly. We want to we use the bedroom. And... OK, so the guys are complaining. It, it is a very small space, this cell. I would say it's about four feet, five feet across and maybe seven feet long. And he's saying that they haven't been given anywhere to use the bathroom and stuff. What were you drinking? Beer, cerveza. <laughs> Just beer. Is this your first time you've been picked up? This is my first time. Once Irma Linda's over and out, I ask her about the most serious crime they've dealt with in Charan in the last year. Accidentes, choques. Car accidents in the road. And murders? No. Uh, rape? No. Armed robbery? Con arma, no. With weapons, no. If you live somewhere unaccustomed to rampant, violent crime, you might not find this surprising. But this is Michoacán, one of Mexico's bloodiest states where just in July alone there were over 180 murders, the highest number of killings in a single month for nearly a decade. So Salvador Campos, the community police officer in charge here at the checkpoint, is checking the vehicles. In 2011, when the uprising happened here in Charan, one of the first things that, that, that they did was to start checkpoints for the three main roads into the town. Uh, five years later, there are around eight or nine community police officers here. They're stopping most of the vehicles that come in, particularly the ones that they don't know, asking people where they're going, where they're from. And people here tell us that, that they feel that these checkpoints have been critical in maintaining security here in Charan. And, and Salvador, sometimes have people from organized criminal groups try to get in? Yeah, they try to pass through, but since we start the checkpoint, they get diversion to cross around Charan and don't go through Charan. So, yeah, because they knew that we are going to stop them and stop the activity that they've been doing. It would take huge firepower from the cartels to overcome resistance in Chiran, but it seems they're not interested in drawing that kind of heat or the attention it would bring. And not when there are easy pickings close by. During the five days we're in the town, none of us feels unsafe, but we're all a bit jumpy when we leave to visit a neighbouring community. Buenos días. ¿Qué tal el calorcito? Pues algo, pero de modo que le hacemos hay que aguantarlo. Cuídense Dile. mucho. Gracias. Gracias igualmente. Dile. Well, the checkpoint here in Nahuatzen is quite a contrast to what we've seen in Charan. It's just an old shack with sacking as walls. Uh, there's one guy here, an older guy. He's not wearing any kind of uniform. And actually what he's got is a box to collect money because in this community, the municipal police have gone, the people are having to police themselves and they need to collect their own salaries. The community of Nahuatzen is so close to Charan but still deeply affected by organised crime. On arrival, we're drawn to the central plaza, where children are commemorating the Mexico-US war. 
Now it sends another indigenous Purapecha town that believed its mayor and the police were compromised by organised crime and drove them out. Now, like Chadan, it's self-governing. And in the brilliant sunshine, as smartly dressed teachers shepherd their uniformed charges into lengthy crocodiles, everything seems calm and safe. It isn't. We meet a local man who tells us about the latest outrage. His words are spoken by someone else to protect his identity. A few days ago, a family were taken hostage at home. The criminals let the man leave the house to find the money they were demanding. Meanwhile, some neighbours found out what was happening. They wanted to ring the church bells to mobilise the community to stop this extortion. They said to the man, come on, we can do it. But he wouldn't, because the criminals said they'd kill his children if anyone interfered. In the end, he got the cash together and the gang left. In Watson, the influence of organised crime has grown because of the lack of security. They look for places where there is an absence of authority. What is it like for you to live with this kind of insecurity? Do you sleep well at night? I sleep very badly, and so do the majority here. We're just waiting for the signal. We have a plan. If three rockets are fired and the church bell rings, we will all come out to deal with whatever problem presents itself. Why do you think that Charan has succeeded in making itself s secure, whereas a community very close to Charan, like yours, not dissimilar, is still really struggling? When everything happened with our mayor last year, Charan offered us advice and help. But some people here were suspicious of that. They thought the state government of Michoacan would help us. So far, they have done nothing. Whenever the criminals decide to come here, they can just come. The conversation we have with this man is dispiriting, to say the least. Buenos días. Está BBC de Londres. Hola, buenos días. ¿Cómo va? Todo tranquilo. Todo tranquilo. And it's a relief to be past the checkpoint and back in Charan, with its welcoming multicoloured recycling bins, an attempt to become Mexico's first town to generate zero waste, and its hand-painted murals shouting, "Political parties, no." At the town hall, the Consejo Mayor, Charan's main governing body, is in session. Two teachers have come to report the difficulties they're having in school. They're just explaining that sometimes they have power cuts and they can't carry on working. Charan hasn't severed ties completely with the Mexican state. It still gets some government funding. Even so, as we listen, I reflect. How has this community survived, thrived even, in such a cruel but beautiful region? We ask that question to everyone we meet. They all say the same thing. Solidarity. Pedro Chavez, one of the councillors, tells us how they guard against the most insidious vice, corruption. We have to give accounts at least once a week to all the town's neighbourhood assemblies. So there's no way anyone can pocket any money. But what's important is the involvement of people in the process of government, and everyone participates. Organised crime is very clever, and they're uh, very skilled at buying people off. So how do you stop that happening in Chilean? We have a central premise. If organised crime isn't given space, they cannot do anything. If one of us collaborates, that's when the door opens. We've talked to some people who have expressed a worry that the bad guys could come back to Chiran. Do you worry that the bad guys could come back? Every part of the community is frightened of that. But I have another fear. We're getting too complacent. Five years ago, we were at the barricades. We didn't sleep much. So I worry that we're losing that alertness. We think everything's fixed now, but the criminals are reorganizing, getting more aggressive. We must stay aware of the reality facing Mexico. And can Chiran survive as this island of peace? That's the challenge, to be able to maintain this life project. This is not about politics or economics. It's a life project rooted in the values and principles of an indigenous community. We looked for a smoking gun in Charan. 
allegations of sleaze, undercurrents of serious dissatisfaction, some kind of indication things were not quite as they seemed. We found little. I ask 18-year-old Melissa Fabian, now a biomedical student, but just a child when the uprising happened five years ago, about the changes in Chiran. Well, I see a big difference in the government, like, is doing more for the town. They're fixing up them streets. You feel like, you feel safe, well, I feel safe right now. Cause you like going streets, walk in the night, and there ain't no, no fear in you that something's gonna happen. So if I come back here in five years to Chiran, how's it gonna be? As long as there's a, at least one person that wants to keep this up, I think we all stand up behind them. You'd be prepared to go into the streets to fight for your town? Yeah, I would be. We all feel proud because we stopped something that like none of the other communities dared to do.